32 call to order um, meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors. Um, because we are doing this virtually, we do have to take the role of the board members. Um, so since there's a lot more people on my screen than I'm used to, um, Jill. Here. Um, Mara? Here. Andrew? Here. Ryan? Here. Bridget? Here. Let's chill again. Um, Where's Jerry? Jerry? He's connecting to the audio right now. Okay, I see Jerry. Jerry is connecting. Hi, everyone. Sorry I'm late. There you go. No worries. Um, we have, so first order is public comment. We have a lot of members of the public. Um, can you all, you know the raise hand function? Does everybody know where that is on Zoom? Give a thumbs up there. If people want to speak, could you please um, uh, either raise your hand or give the thumbs up? So, so right now I see four. Which for? I'm not, it's not showing for me. Mia, Beth, uh, Joan, Amanda. Oh, Allison's raising her hands too. Both hands. <laughs> okay, and who else? Anybody? Oh, and Julia. Mia, Beth, Joan, Amanda, Julia. We have five there. Did we also, just Carolyn. Oh, sorry, Carolyn, I missed you. Yep. And Abby now. Okay, I'm seeing it now. Yes, just so I have it right, I have. Amanda, Beth, Joan, Carolyn, Mia, and Abby. Is that the list? Is those are the six hands I'm seeing? And Julia. Julia and Allison as well. Okay, where are Julia and Allison are not showing up? I believe you. They have their hands raised on screen rather than in the participants. Okay. Julia, who's in the first one? Okay. And Allison. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm seeing the. I'm seeing the hand. Um, so why don't we go? Uh, why don't we go in that order? Um, please try to keep your comments to a minute or less. Um, and uh, so start with with Mia. Please remember to. Um, unmute yourself when you're talking and try to mute yourself when you are not talking to avoid background noise. So Mia? Thanks, Jim. Um, I, uh, and thank you everyone for your um, attention. This is actually my first school board meeting and I'm here um, to speak to the topic of the um, school resource officer um, item on the agenda. I um, just wanted to say very briefly that I, um, don't think we need one. And um, to, I wanted to um, offer that this is an opportunity for um, us as a community to re review why we thought one, we needed one in the first place and see if there are possibly other ways that we could accomplish that purpose or those goals, um, especially knowing that um, the data shows that we don't actually have safer schools when we have police officers in schools. And um, 
uh, if that if that is one of the goals, then what are the other ways that we can accomplish that? And um, it would, depending on what the other goals are for uh, for having a school resource officer, um, and what can we think? And we come come together as a community to think um, creatively and collaboratively about other ways that we can accomplish that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mia. Um, Beth, please. Hi, everyone. Hi. Sorry, I some. Okay, there we go. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I actually wrote my thoughts down, and so I'm going to read you what I'm coming to this meeting to talk about, which is to oppose and ask that we remove school resource officers from our school district. Uh, I can also submit this in writing. It just wasn't clear to me how or where to do that. So I'd love some information at some point. It's not there. It's just being captured on video and exposed more often. People, including Vermont's top law enforcement officials, have said that those problems don't exist here. That Vermont is different. And so we should not let the actions of others in those other states drive our decisions here in Vermont. That claim is false. And the notion that Vermont is exceptional is offensive, particularly to black and brown community members who are disproportionately targeted by police here in Vermont. The evidence clearly demonstrates that police violence and use of force is as present in our communities as it is across the country. In Vermont today, black motorists are stopped and searched at disproportionate rates. Our prisons have some of the worst racial disparities in the entire country. Images of police brutality appear regularly on video recordings, and the number of police killings is steadily increasing. All here in Vermont. What does this have to do with police and schools? Simply put, you cannot ignore the history of police in this country and state in this country and state when discussing their presence in schools. This history does not suddenly disappear when that often white officer walks through the doors at Montpelier High School or any other school in this community, it does not disappear for the black and brown kids who are told by their parents to put their hoodie down while walking outside at night or to keep their hand visible when pulled over by police. It does not disappear for that 10 year old black girl who just a few weeks ago stood up and spoke at a Black Lives Matter rally in Waterbury, crying, and shaking as she explained that white people were lucky to not know what it feels like to feel the fear of police. That for her, it was terrifying sitting in the back seat when just days before her parents were pulled over in Vermont by the police, knowing that with one wrong move, she could see her parents killed in front of her. This is real for people in Vermont, even if it's not real for you. Police do not make all communities feel safe. And schools are meant to be safe places for children. How can we possibly say that some of our students deserve to feel safe while others do not? At what cost? Now let's put that history aside for a minute and address the current arguments in support of police in schools. Two main claims made by proponents of increasing, proponents of increased policing are that school resource officers can control and prevent crime among students and prevent or thwart armed attacks on schools, like school shootings. However, the existing evidence for SRO's increasing safety is mixed at best, with strong evidence of unintended, unintended harmful consequences that come with SRO programs, including thrusting students into the criminal justice system and perpetuating racial inequity. In other words, there is no meaningful evidence to suggest that police presence in schools helps to keep our students safe. And it is evidence we should be basing decisions on for this issue, not presumption. Another major argument is that the presence of police officers in schools helps to establish a positive relationship with people in the community early on and can serve as a resource for students in and out of school, helping to be a bridge when law enforcement gets involved in an out-of-school family situation. Well, the question is for who? For which population? of students does the SRO, SRO serve as a resource. Thinking back to the history of policing and police and its relationship with communities of color, especially the black community, what evidence is there to support this claim when communities of color do not trust police because too often 
interaction with, with them result in harms to their body. It is a fallacy to say police and schools are good for building positive relationships and being a bridge in police interactions with families when the evidence and reality suggests otherwise. The fact is, when law enforcement is placed in a school, black and brown students and students with disabilities are less safe. Some argue that it's okay for police to be in schools because they get additional training to know how to support kids. Yes, SRRs get training on trauma-informed practices. Is it enough? No. Do they get as much as a trained social worker or a school counselor? No. It support, if supporting kids and making them feel safe in our school is our goal with our SROs, then we can meet those goals far better with people more highly trained than a police officer who gets a few additional hours of trauma-informed practices, people like social workers and school counselors. At the end of the day, police are trained to respond to threats, and they are trained to respond with as much force as is necessary, according to them. We have seen time and again how inserting police into situations where a person is having a mental health crisis, for example, escalates the situation. Is that the response we want in our schools? When children with brains that are yet to be fully developed are in the middle of a crisis? At Montpelier High School, where my children will go, 11.6% of the 293 students are students of color, according to 2015 data, which is the most recent available by the Civil Rights Office of the Federal Government. Of the 12 out-of-school suspensions in that year, 66.7% were Black students, but 4.4 of the student population percent was Black, indicating a severe disproportionate impact on Black students at the high school. This is what institutional racism looks like. This is how the school-to-prison pipeline begins. Additionally, 10.9% of the students at Montpelier High School are identified in the 2015 data as students with disabilities, IDAs. While 20 to 25% of students with disabilities received out of school suspensions that year, half of in school out of, and, and out of school suspensions and referrals to law enforcement from Montpelier High School were for students with disabilities. This is unacceptable. The data makes clear that some of our children are not receiving the supports they need to be successful. The Montpelier Roxbury School District should end the use of police in schools and instead provide funding for educational support services. What our kids need is more counselors, more support, and a strong, stronger sense of belonging to this community, not more police. And so it is up to the nine of you to decide as our elected school board members, who are you going to invest in? Are you going to invest in the students of this community? and listen to the voices of the families who are asking you to get armed police out of our schools? Or are you going to prioritize? I'm showing up for my kids um, because I do not want to show up for black death. I do not want to show up for kids in jail. I want to be here to say that police have absolutely no room in our schools. It doesn't matter if they're nice. I know that everybody likes one person but they still carry a gun in their holster. And the thought of seeing having my kids grow up with a police presence in our school is unacceptable. Um, I think that the amount of money that we can put in that salary of 70 plus could go into restorative practices to institute in things that are making our kids feel safe, love, all of them not just because the color of her skin is different. Uh, my kid is a white passing. She will never probably have a problem with the police, but that it's the, not an excuse for us to think about all the kids that do from birth have issues with systemic racism. So I am here to say that the, if there is uh, no vote today, if this is the start in the conversation, we should not be hearing from the police. We should be hearing from community members that are really concerned about coming to drop off our kids to see in a police officer. There. Again, it's not about an individual officer. It's about a systemic issue that we're seeing as a nation. Thank you for your time. And I hope that if you don't make decisions today that you are hearing from the community that is impacted. Hi. Thank you. Um, Joan, uh, if you still want to go, you're up next. 
Sure, thanks. Um, my name is Joan Javier Duval. I'm a resident of Montpelier, and I, along with my husband, have a child entering first grade at Union Elementary School. I'm also a member of Union Parent Group's um, Equity Committee. Um, I'm also a Unitarian Universalist minister. Um, what I want to see for my child and for all of our children is a school environment that supports true safety, community, and belonging for the sake of their learning and development. Um, as maybe you have guessed, I am here also to speak about school resource officers and my belief that they have no place in our schools. You know, what's being made clear yet again in this current moment uh, during this most recent uprising for Black Lives is that we don't, we don't. Um, I also wanted to say that I am um, just coming off of a week long conference of my religious community, a national international gathering um, at which our community passed a resolution in support of the current movement. Um, to really examine the role of uh, police officers and police systems in all of our communities and to really take the lead from um, Black, Indigenous, people of color in all of our communities and to really listen to those stories and experiences. Um, and so that really informs where I'm coming from. And I know that um, all of us here have different sources of where we find guidance and um, where we find sources of our own values and our own morals. Um, and this is, I, I think that the passing of that resolution just really speaks to the fact that this is yet again, another historic moment and historic opportunity um, for us to take seriously the calls to question the role of police and to really um, talk with one another about how best to use our resources towards true uh, safety for all of us and most especially for those who um, are marginalized because of their identities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. Um, Carolyn? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Carolyn Wesley. I am a Montpelier parent, although my one-year-old daughter is not yet in the Montpelier Roxbury School District system. I very much hope that she will be, that we will continue to live in this community. Um, and I am here because in this moment when we are all grappling with the ongoing reality that neither safety and protection under the law nor opportunity to thrive exist equally for everyone in our current structure in this country, I think we are called to restructure and to think about different ways to be in community with one another in our schools and beyond. And up until now, I have not been active in community conversations at this ward or elsewhere around school safety, staffing, promotion of social and emotional well-being and racial equity. And I recognize that there may be good work underway that can be built upon and accelerated at this moment. But I do think that it's clear that both our school district and our city are facing significant budgetary pressures as a result of the pandemic uh, and new ways of needing to work. And this presents an opportunity to reconsider funding priorities in the light of the demands of black and brown people across this country and in our community, which include removing armed police officers from schools. Um, I knew that, know that school resource officers are only one place where systemic racism and inequities show up in our school system. There are many challenges facing black and other students of color, as well as low income students uh, and students with disabilities in our community that you need to tend to as a board. Uh, and all of that requires resources. So I think it makes sense to prioritize school funding for programs better suited to promote the social and emotional well-being and academic success and equity of all students in the district. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Carolyn. Um, Julia? Hi, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I speak to you as a parent of a white child in this district. I'm part of the UES Parents Equity Group and have heard from several other members of that group in support of the message we bring tonight, but couldn't be here. Um, they plan to join us in advocating moving forward. I also speak as a trauma-trained social worker and therapist in private practice working with teens and adults in this community. I would like to add my voice in support of the national call led by black and brown people in this country and in this state to remove school resource officers from all of our schools. In this case, I'm here to advocate for the removal of the SRO from the Montpelier Roxbury Public School District. We are, uh, we are not different. 
we are not immune to such structural racism. And if we are not actively responding to those calls with anti-racist policies and actions, we are choosing to uphold and continue racist systems that harm black students, indigenous students, and all students of color in our community. We often celebrate the fact that Montpelier was the first high school in the country to fly the Black Lives Matter flag. Our superintendent put out a statement following the murder of George Floyd, reiterating that Black Lives Matter. Now we need to take action to back up those gestures. The Black Lives Matter platform calls for defunding the police and removing SROs from schools. It is the responsibility of white residents, officials, and leaders in this community to show up and take action in support of the students in our district who have been engaging with racial justice and calling for this change, among others. As a trauma-trained therapist, what I will speak to directly is the argument that SROs are trained to be trauma-informed. Trauma-informed has become a buzz term. In my experience, very little trauma tra training, including at the highest levels, actually addresses institutional, historical, or generational trauma. In that case, what does trauma-informed mean when it doesn't take into account the institutional, historical, or generational trauma that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color have lived through in this country? When the person who said to be trauma-informed is wearing a gun or a uniform that has been worn by others while causing trauma inflicted by violence, uh, causing trauma by inflicting violence or profiling people who look like our students or who are our students, how could we expect our BIPOC students to feel safe and equally access their rightful education when a police officer, someone who represents that historical and current violence, is a daily part of their school environment? This is true regardless of how well-loved and supportive any individual SRO may be. The 2015 statistics on suspensions for my Montpelier High School indicate that out of the 12 of the 12 out of school suspensions that year, 66.7 were black students, but 4.4 of the student population was black. As Beth said, this is what institutional racism looks like. Thank you for doing this research, Beth. <laughs> and I will add that this is what racialized trauma looks like. Additionally, in 2015, half of in school out of school suspensions and referrals to law enforcement were students with disabilities. This is what discrimination looks like. This is what institutional trauma looks like. This is unacceptable and we must take action. These statistics demand that we take new, appro new approaches. With the money you choose to divest from policing in our schools, we can invest more deeply in restorative justice, mental health support for students, and equity based initiatives with a central focus on ensuring that all of the children in our school district thrive. Listen to black and brown parents and students in our community. Choose to make an impact on structural racism in our schools. Invest in solutions that replace trauma with healing. Thank you. Great, thanks, Julia. And I apologize, I just noticed my camera has been off. Um, I think that's that's everyone. Do I, are there, is there anyone else who wants to speak? Allison, sorry. Um, go ahead. Um, um, my name is Allison Maney, and I'm a resident of Montpelier, an educator in another uh, school district, and I'm um, a mom of two black kids who go to, um, one who goes to Montpelier High School and one who will go to Montpelier High School next year, um, uh, and I have their permission to speak. I had hoped my daughter would be uh, willing to speak, and she was earlier today, but then uh, she just got too nervous. Um, uh, both my kids have said that they um, think that the SRO um, has been very friendly in their school. They've had conversations um, with the SRO outside of school, um, and yet they're still very fearful. Uh, my daughter um, talks very eloquently about feeling um, terrified uh, when she sees the police officer in the school. And um, both my kids don't necessarily feel like Montpelier is a very safe place for them, not just the school, but in general. Um, there was a black man that was shot in Montpelier. Um, there was a man with mental health issues shot in Montpelier. Um, and there was somebody, um, a young person shot on the you know, school behind Montpelier High School. Um, all of these very specific local um, issues, moments in time, plus with the black viral death that um, they are seeing on social media is making this a really traumatizing time for them. Um, and I'm worried about them going back to school. I'm worried about them um, being able to 
um, feel safe, um, follow the enforcement of, of new rules um, that COVID is going to be um, placing on them. And I'm worried that their um, uh, lack of compliance, normal teenage lack of compliance, um, will be seen differently because they are so dark skinned and outspoken um, and not always super compliant um, like teenagers. Uh, and so I guess as a mom, I'm terrified. I'm really, and I know it's not just an issue of having an SRO in the school. Um, but that is just one um, gesture that I feel like our school district can really be making right now um, and making a big uh, statement around that in support of, of my children and other people of color and people with disabilities um, in this community. And I would really, um, I, I also just want to say I'm very heartened to hear everybody who has spoken um, against SRO in school, it makes me feel much less alone, and um, and that means a lot right now. So, thank you. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, anyone else? Yes. Thanks. Uh, oh. Uh, Jim, this is Lalita. Lalita, my Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, right. um, yeah, that's Lolita. I'm Corby. Uh, both of us are parents of two mixed race children in the schools. Um, one is entering the high school and one is in middle school. Um, and I mean, in support of what everybody else has said, yes, I think having um, a social worker um, uh, in the school would probably be a, a better use of the money than an SRO. Um, my kids have, well, one of them has experienced um, racism that got kind of dismissed by the police um, when it was brought to their attention. And that was a very disappointing outcome. Um, and since then, I, I think that the the level of trust has um, has lessened with with both of my kids, um, with police officers, and um, I think it's important that we use you know our, our limited finances better um, and. Somebody called this a, a, a statement, and I think it's more than a statement. I think it, it's, it's an approach that needs to happen in Montpelier. If we're going to be serious about addressing systemic racism, we need to make changes. And this is one of the first changes I believe we need to make. Well, it is. Anything you wanted to add? Uh, so when my daughter went through that racism incident, uh, when I say it is racism, the police officer, um, I'm sorry, it, it brings up a lot of stuff for me because I, as a person of color, have encountered a lot of racism too. So to see my own kid going through um, was really uh, very traumatic. So. When that happened, I had to take her to the police uh, station because uh, the kid that was involved was not from Ampere High School. It happened in our local library. So I had to take her to the police station a couple of times so we can talk to the officer. And this was really not even not only traumatic for me, but traumatic for my kid who was like 11 years old or 10. And she had to uh, recount again what happened. Uh, she got called names, she got hit, uh, there were bruises on her, uh, and I would prefer a social worker, not a cop, Absolutely. to come and help us deal with the situation. Um, someone who has um, um, experience in mental health, um, is that correct word? Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm just very disappointed when when 
me or a person of color says this is racism and the police officer says just no and sweeps it under the carpet right. uh and you know it's if you don't have the training you cannot uh see what i see and and even with the training um you know you, you know the minimal training in in systemic racism that police have received or may receive um it won't be enough. It won't be anywhere near the level of training that um, a social worker who is trained specifically in um, racist issues um, would be able to, well, not just racist, but, but issues for children um, would be able to see. Um, I think, I just think our money is far better spent um on somebody a counselor who can help with the issues if police are needed they can be called but i don't think police are needed full-time or even part-time inside the school and the other thing i remember is uh we i was guilt tripped in not taking any action against that young kid because i was going to ruin his uh future if i were to take action and um, um, I forgot the other one. Uh, shoot. Um, and uh, if a social worker was involved, um, she, they would have told me this new information. So the following year, that same student from a different school who attacked my daughter enrolled in the same school again. Enrolled in her school. In, in, in her school again, in the middle school. So that was, it was like a slap on my face because I was not told, my daughter was not told, and for her to see that proper, um, perpetrator, perpetrator uh, in the school was traumatic to her. And I, I had to tell her, coach, I tell her that just ignore him, don't go near him, you know, if anything happens, let me know. So it's, it's really disappointing uh, to find out um, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, very eloquently stated and um, very helpful, I think, certainly to me and I'm sure to the rest of the board as well. Um, uh, so I think I, I suggest that uh, in the board discussion, we move the SRO to the top of the list so that way we don't have people have to hang on through other discussions. Um, so why don't we do the consent agenda and then we can go to the SRO portion of the board discussion um, just again so uh, folks don't have to listen to. Um, the discussions are probably not uh, taking time out of their Wednesday evening for. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Do you have a second? Second. Second. Um, so we have to do roll call again. Uh, Jill? Here. It's, uh, I. It's I or not. I. I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless you want to vote present. Um, Mara? I. Uh, Andrew? I. Uh, Ryan? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Uh, Jerry? Aye. And I don't think I missed anyone. Um, okay, so now uh, we'll go to the board discussion portion and let's, um, let's start off with the SRO role and then we'll do um, the other four items. Um, <laughs> Kim, if I can just say there's a comment in the chat, I think maybe from Bill about, did we possibly cut off com public comment before it was done? Oh, I'm sorry, did we? So, uh, but it was, it's was, Bill, was, um, um, I, I don't know how you normally do your, your business. Um, I think, I I assume we could comment during the agenda item, but if we missed it. Um, uh, no, and I'm, I'm sorry if I overlooked uh, you. I thought Lolita was the last, but go ahead and we'll we'll reopen just 
Um, sure. Well, I'll try to be brief. Uh, thank you for having this. This is certainly a very difficult issue as uh, many of the people here are involved are also uh, talking to us about policing and we take that very seriously. So my name is Bill Fraser. I am a 25 year resident of Montpelier. I have four kids that went all through Montpelier schools uh, from kindergarten to 12, all graduates uh, and had wonderful experiences. Um, I'm also the city manager for the city and as such I oversee the police department. Um, I would urge you as you have this conference, so, so I mean obviously I, I tend to favor this, but I also think it is important to listen to everybody's voices. I would urge you that as you consider this decision, you take a look at Montpelier specific data. Um, our data at the, you know, shows us that there is no history, at least in terms of police stops, police arrests that, um, that show a bias uh, in Montpelier, but uh, that should be proved. You shouldn't take my word for it. Take a look at cases like the suspensions and find out how many of those uh, involved the SRO. I don't know the answer. Were those uh, police involved decisions or was that uh, something else? Because as somebody earlier said, and I guess I, I'd have to reinforce that, I don't think that removing the SRO is going to change, is going to suddenly end racism in the city or in, in the schools. Uh, there, there are systems that are involved there. I would urge people to uh, Take a look at cases that were referred uh, where there, you know, the, the suggestion was made people with special needs that it shows a bias. Perhaps you should you should maybe look at each one. Or was it a safety situation? I'm aware of cases where students were throwing chairs around and were out of control and uh, there wasn't anyone in the building, you know, able to handle that. So they called in the resource over for assistance to um, get some safety and control for the students. So to make sure that we understand why those referrals were made and what those things happened. Um, ask, and, and to that end, I would urge that uh, the staff and the teachers be consulted uh, about the, the impact of this role, uh, what kind of support they, they have. I think none of us uh, endorse the idea of, sort of all. The, the fully uh, militarized police officer strolling the, the hallways, um, but I think uh, that is not the goal or the, the system we've tried to have, but if there are problems that we'd like to hear, particularly about very specific problems. Um, with regard to social workers, uh, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on the school budget. I know for some period of time there was a school social worker in the schools. There's three. Uh, and uh, so they do exist and I find it, and I, people that may or may not be aware about the, the budget that starts today, uh, for the city includes funding for an embedded social worker in with the police department to handle these kind of calls. So we, we hear that and, uh, you know, an armed police officer isn't always the, the best person. Um, I'd like to quickly address the shootings. Someone brought up the shootings and um, I think, and I don't want to get into detail because it's sad and scary. There was a black person shot, but it was not, the police were not involved in that. That was a crime uh, and a person has been convicted for that, that homicide uh, that, and because of the work of our police that was not a police involved shooting uh, and without going into great detail on the two uh, police involved shootings in both cases uh, an hour plus was spent trying to de-escalate the situation and in both cases the individuals pointed guns at officers and threatened to kill them and so the officers responded uh, out of their own safety. We can like that or not, but those are, are the facts. They're, neither of those calls were initiated by the police seeking to pull someone over, and neither of those calls involved persons of color. So I, I'm very, we are sensitive to the issues. I urge you all to get everyone, all of us, um, so I don't know the answer to some of these questions I've raised. They may, uh, I think it's incumbent on all of us to engage in the conversation, get the information and see uh, what has actually been happening in the Montpelier schools, what's been happening in the Montpelier community, engage our new police chief, who uh, I know is interested in, in talking about this. I believe he's here uh, on the call, although I'm not going to volunteer him to speak unless he wants to. Uh, but that's my question. Do it thoughtfully, get the information, and make a decision based on what's right for um, what's right for our city uh, and make sure that we're doing the right thing for Montpelier. Thank you, Bill, and apologies um, for not seeing you wanted to speak. Um, just before we totally cut off public comment and move on, is there anyone else um, who wants to speak before we um, turn either? Like, yes. <laughs> just, um, one, just one uh, last comment. Um, picking off of what Bill said, um, 
I, you know, I, I recognize that sometimes um, police will be, be needed. And, but I wonder if that is something that can be done with a police call. And secondly, students throwing chairs or what have you, um, I mean, I work at the hospital. We talk people down, violent people down all the time. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm, tra I'm trained in that. Um, I think that's something that doesn't necessarily have to be a police officer. And in fact, oftentimes it's best when it isn't. But that's, that's my opinion. I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Great, thank you. And is there anyone, I, I don't want to cut anyone off. I also want to get into a, a, a broad debate because we do have to move on to the meeting. Is there anyone who has not spoken who, who would like to speak briefly? Hello, good afternoon or good evening. Um, you're on deck, I believe, as well. Uh, you're, you're, on, you're, you're on the, uh, the, main, the main agenda. Um, oh, okay. I just hold off then? Yeah, let's move to that and we can uh, have Libby kick off the SRO discussion and I think she's got a, a slot for you to, to speak. So we're, we're very, very interested and excited to, to hear from you and uh, welcome aboard, by the way. Thank, Thank you so much. Libby? Yeah, we can actually, John, don't go away there, Chief Pete. We're, we'll jump in. Uh, the Chief and I met yesterday, so I know that he re he wants to, to talk um, about this this uh, process. We also have Matt Nisley here, who is no longer our SRO, um, but Matt was the, uh, I should say Detective Nisley, if I'm being professional, Detective Nisley should, um, was our SRO for six years, for the past six years. Um, and so he's got a good history of the role of the SRR, SRO in schools. I want to thank everyone who came to the meeting. And I know I speak for the board when I say it's delightful, even though this is a very hard conversation, it's, it's wonderful to see your faces um, and participate in the discussion. Um, and so thank you for coming, coming out and sharing your stories that are not easy to share um, in any way, shape or form, particularly in a public forum. So I very much appreciate it. And I also invite you to make a session with me to talk to me about that about your experiences um, in the schools. I know some of you pretty well, but I don't know all of you. Um, and so I welcome anybody to come take, make a meeting with me to, to talk through um, some of your concerns and things like that. So as I start my third year um, as superintendent of Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools, um, the SRO position has, has been one um, that I quite honestly have relied on as a superintendent. Um, I, get, I can't sugarcoat that at all. Matt, um, Detective Nisley, has been um, a resource for me as a superintendent, learning how to run a system with um, school safety at the heart. Uh, he also participates in every single meeting that we have. Um, as teams with our social workers and our administrators. He knows our kids, he knew our kids pretty well. Um, and so when he was coming um, to support either administration or social workers or guidance counselors and teachers and students, he was doing it from a place of knowledge because that's what, that was his position he took. Um, Detective Nisley can also share several stories um, of keeping kids out of the criminal justice system. And when I asked him um, for data around that piece from the six years he worked there, and, and Matt, please correct me if I get any of this wrong, um, he, only one student was, was brought to the criminal justice court system under his, uh, his role as the SRO. Um, and that's in six years. So it's not that he didn't have the opportunity for others potentially, um, but he was able to work in conjunction with Montpelier's excellent restorative justice center to work with, with kids and families to move in a different direction than the criminal um, justice uh, court system. So with that, with that collaboration with the restorative justice center, um, it's, worked, it's worked in the way that we'd like to. Now that doesn't belittle or demise or take away from the fact that, that that what is happening across our nation and in our state is, is not right. And that there are several concerns that we have in making sure that all of our kids feel safe, particularly our kids of color, 
feel safe every single day and thrive in our school system. And it's not taking away from that. And it's not taking away from that desire. Um, but I do want to want to state that the SRO position in my tenure here at, at Montpelier Roxbury has been um, supportive of our students and has been supportive of our administration and our goals to protect and, and keep kids on the, on the path we want them to be on. Um, and I think that needs to be stated. Um, but as I'd like to give uh, Chief Pete a chance to, um, to take part in this discussion um, and Officer Nisley, if Detective Nisley, if you'd like to, um, just to state from their opinion as well. Um, and again, I appreciate anybody, everybody who's come out tonight, absolutely. Um, so Chief Pete, would you like to take the floor? Hello and good evening, everyone. Can, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, uh, to, to, to speak. And um, I just want to say this is a very um, personal uh, topic for me. Um, that uh, we cannot discount. And I encourage the school board um, to not discount the, the emotions, the fear, um, the, the anger and the experiences that some people have have dealt with um, regarding um, past instances with the police. Um, those are real. And um, so I, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged and grateful for the for this dialogue. But I, I also need to say that um, no one's this conversation. Um, that we all should be involved in this conversation to, uh, to, to, to talk about these things and, um, and, to, and to make the decisions based on what has happened here in Montpelier and not in the actions that happened in, in Minneapolis. And so if, if I may share a, a, a story, um, uh, my father was... Uh, working within the Chicago public school system. I'm, I'm, I am a black man born and raised on the city south side. My experiences with police officers have been mixed. My experiences with SROs um, have been mixed. And I see the comment, yes, that's what I'm saying. It is not about Minneapolis, it's, it's about Vermont. It's about how the police department in Vermont is dealing with, um, with with the issues and how we can become community partners and try to find a way past uh, what's been going on systemically and, and within our institution. So I just say that I think the the many levels that you have, the, the many opportunities, it's incumbent upon us to try to put as many people who care and who want to make a positive difference. And yes, police officers do care. We do want to make positive differences. We want, we want to be there to help our communities. And the more people that you have that are able to see something and to slip uh, and to keep someone from slipping through the cracks, um, because we're all doing more with less. Staff is doing more with less. Uh, social workers are doing more with less. Counselors, um, teachers. Um, but it's just an, another set of eyes to help someone in need. The Montpelier Police Department is not here to, we have flaws, we have mistakes, and we're working towards things, but we're not here to, to, to be a, a symbol of institutional racism. That's the last thing I would ever want to be a part of. So I, I think that this conversation uh, warrants a look and a discussion of it's how the schools use the SRO. We don't, we should not, we don't need officers there. It's going to escalate a situation where um, an officer may not be able to relate uh, or, or to develop a sense of trust um, with, with students, with our, with our children. And my daughter's going to school there as well. So I've, I've, I've seen my father pull people out of really bad situations. And he did it without sending them to jail. He did it with, with partnering with other teachers and staff members and saying, hey, I think this is going on. And yes, we may not have the training or the education that a social worker does, but we have training and education and life experiences to understand when we see someone who is struggling in life and having problems, 
that we can de-escalate any situations to crises and move them to the people that do that work. We're not claiming to be social workers. We don't want to be a Gestapo walking around. It's not about safety. Montpelier has different challenges and needs than other places. And we need to make sure that we address those challenges and needs and we respond to them. So um, I just say that um, there is a national conversation. And this is the scripted part, but there's a national conversation to, to, to be had. And we're having it now. It's great regarding the roles of police officers in the schools. But Montpelier has been doing this um, right for a long time. This is the first time we're addressing this issue. This hasn't been something that each school board meeting, you've been having to talk about complaints with SROs. I think that for all of us to come to a place that we're comfortable with each other, we all have to be involved in a dialogue. And we all have to understand that a lot of arguments are like, it's not about one individual person, then what is it about? We, we have to love each other. We have to tolerate each other. We have to, we have to understand where each other's coming from. We have to figure out what our department needs to do to right the wrongs of what's been going on institutionally wise. So um, I would just ask in making your decision about the SRO program that you judge our department based on the relationship that we've had with our community and the merit of the things that we've accomplished um, and not about the challenges that other locations may have. So I really am hoping for the opportunity to speak um, with you guys more in depth. I understand if you have to make that decision now, but I'm also hoping to continue this dialogue uh, regardless of what happens um, uh, here. But I want to continue the dialogue with people here who have been affected and who have, uh, everyone's concern here is legitimate. But we have to talk through them. We have to talk about it. We have to figure out where to go. And um, so I would just I just ask for that, um, those opportunities to be heard and judged in our personal merits. So thank you all very much for this. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, are you okay taking questions from the board, if, if they have any, about um, yes, why you're so bad first and then, then? Yes, I am. Any questions for the chief before I hear from uh, Officer Nisley or Detective Nisley? Um, Matt, go ahead. Oh, that hurts. They may come later. <laughs> and, 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 and Matt is fine. Um, you know, six years being with the kids for me was an honor and a definite privilege to be part of that community. And I learned more from being part of that community and working with educators and social workers than, um, uh, than probably ever in my career. Um, just a couple of quick stories, and I'm not... It, I, I see some comments. It's not about me. I agree with you. This is a conversation we need to be having. What, what I will say is when we talk about school safety, the scariest time I had as a resource officer was sitting in Mike McGrath's office when we were talking about getting the Black Lives Matter flag up and making sure that those kids were safe with the amount of national outcry and and just hate and violence that was being targeted at our school and our community was the scariest time I've ever had as a police officer to make sure that those kids were safe and that all of our kids were safe in the, the school during that. Um, and I took that very seriously and very personally when, when those threats came in. Um, and I lost a lot of sleep over that. And, and it wasn't, it, and it was about that keeping that whole community of kids safe and, and thinking about them being outside and the amount of threats and the amount of national threats that were going on. Uh, we, we had a, a lot of, a lot of hours of planning to make that a safe event. And, and thankfully we did, it, you know, the other, the other thing I will say is, and, and Lydia brought this up, um, you know, one arrest in the six years that actually went to traditional court, um, that was, that, that takes work and takes relationships to make that happen. Um, and knowing the kids in the school and being able to, to point them in the direction of resources to keep them out of the court system 
is what the position is all about. Uh, strong partnership with the Community Justice Center, with social workers at school, with you know family court when when needed, um, and having that that knowledge of the kids to to know what we can do to help in that partnership with parents and community members was so important in, in getting kids through to graduation. Um, it, you know, there were certainly times when, when cases could have gone to traditional criminal justice system. And, it, you know, because of that relationship and that knowledge of what kids were going through, I was able to point those kids in other directions, which helped them be successful and get through to graduation, which is you know, what serves us best as a, as a system is getting kids through graduation in a happy, healthy way. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about what our program has been. Uh, and certainly I don't discount anyone here speaking of personal experience. Sorry, I'm, I was muted. Um, Thank you, Matt. Any any questions for uh, for Officer Nisley? I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mara. go ahead, Mara. Yeah. Um, so yeah. my quick question on the Black Lives Matter uh, piece was, um, could Montpelier Police Department have been called and contracted with or consulted or otherwise used for protective <laughs> during the all oh, puppy dog? Um, uh, during the Black Lives Matter national incident without having a uniformed armed officer in school daily? Sure, I, 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 I can answer that, or I'm sure Brian could as well. If, if you call us, we are coming. There is, no, there is no doubt about that. We are here for our community, no matter what the role is that we're, we're, we inhibit. The, I think the difference was being able to be there with those students and, and, and part of those discussions on a daily basis with the, as the threats were rolling in and as things were happening um, gave an entirely different perspective than someone getting called into a, you know, an hour meeting or whatever um, than, than we would have had. Is that something you imagine that the school district could have done on a long, long term basis anyway, though, like as they noticed um, threats of a, of a larger scale coming in? Could they have um, like initiated an interaction with the police department um, and then had multiple interactions as the situation developed? And would that have served the same purpose? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to like because obviously we don't have a national incident every day. Right. So in the event that we would have another mass big incident like that, is, is are there other ways to engage in protections that still fulfill the purposes of making sure the kids are safe without having an armed uniformed person in the hallways daily? Matt, maybe can I uh, jump in? If, if I'm um, Mara, one of the things, I wasn't here, obviously, for the Black Lives Matter, because that was before I was superintendent. Um, but if I were to put myself in, in Brian's shoes at that time, or Mike's shoes at that time, I would think one of the big differences, uh, and Matt, correct me on this, is the relationship. So we've had other safety events after that in my realm, right? Being able to text Matt because I know him and we've built a relationship and I know he knows our schools as well as he does is very different from me calling a random police officer and saying, hey, we need some help here. Um, and I know when I call Matt and say, I need to talk to you about this, then I know I'm taken seriously and I know that it's going to, like, we're going to be able to, I'm going to be very honest and, and vulnerable around what I'm going to say because we've built that relationship together. Um, I don't have a relationship with Diane yet because I don't know her very well. Um, she hasn't she hasn't joined yet. But but that for me as an administrator, yes, we yes the school district probably could have collaborated with the Montpelier Police Department during the Black Lives Matter flag and and ensure that the that our kids were safe and ensure that we had the process in place. I, mean, I have no doubt about it. Knowing 
Montpelier Police Department, right? And knowing the administrators in our school buildings, um, that would have been their number one priority at that moment. The relationship uh, in that particular, with, with something as intense as that, or like the potential school shooter that was at the uh, tax department last, when was that, fall? when I could just text Matt and say, or Matt actually texted me and said, lock your schools down, lock your schools down now, right? There's, there's that relationship there that I don't question it, it just, it just does. It's a, it's a piece. Is it a major piece? Could we get around it? Probably. Um, however, it's a piece that's important to put out. And if I may also add, uh, I think that what, what we are is we're, we're here we're on, we're on the side, we're on everyone's side and we, we need, we want that opportunity to, to gain the trust of the people here, um, of the students, especially. And I think that if they do understand, um, they, they see officers and they're under, able to understand that officers are human and that we can interact with, with children, with kids, with our students. Then when times like these happen, God forbid they ever have to happen again, but should they have to happen that they know that we're here and, and, and we want to make sure that they're safe. Um, so I, I just would, would, would think that we should have the conversation about how SROs should fit into the plan, should fit into school safety or involvement. Um, when we see something, definitely we should have that have that plan. But I think that uh, this is an opportunity to to, to add another layer um, of, of of someone who can identify someone who's struggling with something um, and then move forward. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Detective. Thanks, everyone who has uh, contributed this evening. Um, you know, as as a board, I'm sitting here, obviously, you know, our our role in this is we establish policies, we, we work on the budget, we negotiate a contract with the teachers union. But obviously, our superintendent is held accountable to us. And we are the representatives of our community. Uh, with, with regard to the direction of our public schools. And so we are getting into some nitty gritty here that we normally don't, but this is a big enough and important enough conversation that I think it does warrant it from the board. I don't think we can just sit on the sidelines um, and say, administration, you know, we're just gonna let you go with this. I think it's important for us to be part of this conversation. And, you know, anecdotes are one part of that, and I'm hearing a lot of anecdotes, but I'm really curious to know as an employer, as a, kind of a, a, communi a community trustee of one of our most important institutions, you know, do we have clearly defined responsibilities for this position? Do we have a clearly defined purpose for this position? Do we have job specifications? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. Libby, maybe you can answer that. Yeah, it's is it formalized on paper from our end? No, it could be at the police department. Um, but as far as our job descriptions, because they're not technically our employee, they're the Montpelier Police Department employees. So the job description piece, if that's what you're going after, Andrew, it would be at the police department. Because I think for our schools, if we're going to have a police officer in our school, we need to have a conversation and we need to clearly establish what is the role of this SRO at our school? What do they do? What do we want them to do? Should this person be the one that does this work or might it be better suited to some other type of professional? That's the type of conversation that I've been hearing from community members. And I've been hearing from a lot of community members across a broad range of backgrounds on this issue. And I, I think we owe it to the community to have this conversation and to flesh these details out. Yeah, we can talk, Matt Agvold and, and uh, Chief Pete can talk about exactly what the role is currently for the SRO. Um, so I'll start listing, Matt jump in, Chief Pete jump in whenever um, I've missed one. Uh, so the SRO currently, is collaboration with the school safety team or the district safety team as well as each school-based safety team. So that's for crisis situations, it's for any kind of school safety event. Uh, they play a huge role in training our staff for those situations, which are mandated by the state. 
um, as well as helping us wade through lots of different opinions as to how school safety should be run. They also are a big part of that collaboration so that should the awful event happen or tragic event happen in a school, then they are there to respond. They know our buildings really well. They know what our processes are. They know what our, our response is so that we, nobody's guessing each other. We've, made a, we've collaborated to make those plans together. In addition, whenever there's a threat made against our school and schools in any way, shape, or form, the SRO is the one who goes and does a threat assessment. So it could be going to a student home or a family's home or a community member's home, whoever made the threat, to do an assessment to say, is, is this a threat that is something that needs to be followed through on, or is this, a, is this um, not necessarily one that, that could be reality? I'm not, I'm not sure how you would reframe that in a different way. <laughs> Uh, our SRO also helps when kids are highly um, dysregulated at times during the school day when it gets beyond um, what our school building's capacity is. Uh, and it usually involves whatever's happening in the hallways or things like that rarely happens inside a classroom. Um, but it's more student is left in some way or um, run out of the building in some way uh, often it could be a kid has, we've lost a kid and not we, but in terms of a kid has run away and the SRO is helping with the family and, the, and other police is the connection between the school, the family and uh, community officers to help us find that kid um, and keep that kiddo safe. Uh, the is, SRO is also part of all of our weekly meetings um, with, with administration guidance counselors and social workers. There are liaison to the uh, Restorative Justice Center, um, certainly, to make sure that we have that collaboration in place with the Restorative Justice Center. The social work, or the SRO also works closely with our social workers if they need to make a home visit to a home that has um, some challenges going on to safety for, for our staff and our social worker. Um, in that situation, they, the SRO will accompany the social worker, so the social worker can do their job with mental health um, and and feel safe while doing it. Uh, Matt, what am I missing here? It's a pretty good list. I mean, I think um, you know one of the one of the other things that we haven't touched on is is just the um, collaboration with the social workers on truancy issues and, and okay. helping get to school and through graduation. Um, you know, going out to do home visits day after day to try to get kids to just show up. And, and that's, you know, that, that isn't just a police officer going to the door. That's going with the social workers to the door to um, figure out what is, what's the impediment, what, what's stopping those kids from getting to school. Um, and, you know, certainly it, at times that also involved uh, referrals to the Community Justice Center who did phenomenal work with a few of our students, getting them through all the way to graduation recently um, from zero attendance three years ago. So it's those, you know, those community partnerships that that are so important. The other thing, one last thing, sorry, Chief e, one last thing that I know that uh, Matt has certainly helped us with is that uh, people try to get into our district. And so Matt is the detective who will go look to see if they actually live within our boundaries and, and have some, yeah, just as a small piece, but it's also a piece. Go ahead, sorry, GP, go for it. No, no ma'am, it's okay. I, I just, uh, if I can add that, I, we're, I wanna make it clear that we're not advocating to replay or to replace social workers or counselors. We're not advocating to do that position. We're just another resource that can, uh, that can be there. Um, we just want to, um, and if I can, I'll just go off based on on, uh, on what, what it is that, that our police department, uh, our creed, and we look to the 21st century um, policing practices and models, and there's three of them. So, so basically, SROs must create, and I'm just quoting it so I don't get it wrong, um, that we're creating opportunities in schools and communities for positive non-enforcement interactions with police. We establish memorandums of agreement for a place of school resource officers that limit police involvement and student discipline, and that we have to try to restore and build trust between youth and police by creating programs and projects for positive, consistent, and persistent interaction between youth and police. And we'll never have that opportunity to have those interactions unless we can 
we can be allowed um, to be on school campuses and, and to have those interactions because that's what we're trying to do is foster and to improve uh, uh, relationships and to have to be there to have that national dialogue that if someone who, who, who can come up to a police officer and say, why are you guys racist or why is this happening within our communities, that that officer can be there to have that, that conversation and that that officer can be there for that student uh, to vent and to hear and to understand, and we can learn in turn with that. So I just... Um, what we follow as we come into, uh, as we proceed, hopefully with our SRO program. Um, so I I get the, Jim, can I clarify, we aren't making a decision tonight necessarily. No, we are simply getting educated on the position um, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mara. Yeah. So I, um, I feel like it bears further discussion, uh, like what, what do we need done in the schools? Who is best to do them? And I don't know how we go about, um, looking at something like that. I know I'm new to the board, so I don't know what the role of the board is and what the role of the board isn't, but, um, I'm mainly interested for the purposes of, you know, kind of leading and caretaking schools um, in knowing, like, what are the things that need to be done and what are the ways they could be done? And are they being done in the best way now? And that sounds like a really big question. And so I'm kind of tossing that over to Libby, too. Uh, those are my big, big questions, and they seem bigger than um, they seem like you'd have to do some digging. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think those are, are the questions that, that um, we want to look into. Um, also, let me, what's the, I, I mean, I understand the SRO is a, a city employee, not a district employee, but what's, what's the actual document that governs the relationship? Um, yeah, I mean, for instance, um, you know, the SRO attends, you know, certain meetings. Is that just a practice that's developed or... Is there like an MOA between the city and the district that defines the role and uh, responsibilities kind of as per the relationship? If there is one, I've never seen it. Okay. So, so I've never signed something yearly or something like that. So if, if there is one that it's out of date and we, and we don't have one that's updated, Matt, you might be able to tell, tell something different there. Yeah, what I can say is it's... Um, you know, Mark Moody started a very long time ago doing this and built the program. And I came in, was trained by him, and took over those roles and responsibilities. And they have been, um, you know, over the years modified to fit what what works best for the school district and the students. Um, but as far as a new written document, I have not been involved in creating an MOU. And Matt, and Brian, does that does that is there something at MPD that that's the written down description of what the relationship and role are supposed to be? We have um, we have uh, in, in, internal expectations. I have to double again. I just started as well, so I need to double check and to make sure um, that what we have, but um, uh, just to make sure that we have those things uh, codified in writing. But uh, but the best practice. Is um, this conversation especially warrants it um, that we need to make sure that within any policies that we have on our end, because um, we we give our expectations to our SROs. SROs. This is what we expect you to do, um, but we need to make sure that we codify all of those in writings and memorandums of, of, of agreement that. Um, we're not overstepping or we're not uh, coming in to create a, an environment of fear, uh, of distrust. We need to make sure that anything that's outlined within an MOA um, is the will of the, uh, the superintendent of Libby and the will of the board. And that, that's what we're here for. We're here to look to be looking to be partners to try to figure out different ways as, as best as we possibly can. Any opportunity that we have to extend safety to our students, um, we, we want to be a part of it. Great, thank you. Uh, do any other board members have, have questions for? Can, can I just add one comment quickly, if I may? Um, 
it's a little it's a little out of turn. Um, is this something you could send us writing? I just I just don't want to. If I open it up to you, I feel I have to open it up to everyone. I'm a little well, it was actually okay. All right, I'll send you something. Sorry, right. sorry, Bill. It wasn't an advocacy position. Uh, no, I, it's it's. Um, yeah, you, know, you can put in the chat if, if it's a, a quick piece of information. I think everyone can see it. But um, uh, any any board members who have further questions for Bridget? Yeah, I um, and I also want to echo what other board members have said in thanking everyone that has come here come here to our virtual meeting tonight and and spoken. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about the day to day experience of having a, a school resource officer in the high school and is it only the high school and I you know there have been a lot of references to having an armed police officer I I assume as an officer he's um carrying a weapon but I don't actually know um what uniforms police cars like what what does it look like I'd like to hear more about that if that's possible tonight if I may I'm sorry. I, I spoke to Libby earlier again yesterday, and we talked about what um, what what this should should continue to look like. So we want to make sure that it's a soft appearance. We don't want to have. Um, we're looking at not uh, using marked cars. We're looking at using unmarked cars. We're looking at at, at uh, SROs dressing the same way. Unfortunately, we would as much as I would. I'd love to not have to carry weapons. Um, we are a smaller department. So in the event that, that an emergency happens, uh, we're going to, and, and the SRO needs to respond, we're going to need her to respond as soon as possible. So we would prefer to make sure our officers stay armed. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't walk through the halls concealed. That doesn't mean that that, that any weapons have to be you know visible to um to the students so we just want to make sure it's a soft approach and that officers are interacting not sitting in offices um that they have not been matt has not been doing that um but just going around and and talking to kids and just working on gaining trust and and whatever it is that that the board determines that the thinks that this is going to be the best way for us to interact and to gain that trust that would be part of an moa what your vision would be From my perspective, Bridget, um, sometimes I wouldn't see the SRO for many weeks. Um, sometimes I'd see them daily. Sometimes Matt would make several visits a day into my office to tell me about um, a situation that he was working with, working on in terms of a threat assessment or something. Um, the SRO is always a part of our district-wide safety committee that meets monthly and always a part of the school-based safety committees that meet pretty much monthly. Um, so I'd, I'd work with the SRO during that time and look to them for their expertise and, and safety then. Um, other times, uh, Matt would be coming in to see if I needed something, um, if, see if something was going on. He'd be talking to me about situations that were happening outside of the community that I might need to be aware of. So from my perspective, sometimes it was a lot, sometimes it wasn't. Principals would have a probably different answer for you um, than, than I do as a superintendent. Um, but we don't have any of our principals on here tonight. We can certainly invite them the next time we talk about this. Um, so you get a different point. You're, I, you're asked about um, the different school buildings. So um, Matt, or the SRO position is based in the high school, certainly has is at the middle school often, um, and occasionally works with Ryan at the elementary school. But And usually that's an on-call piece. Ryan, Ryan will call to, if, the, if he needs support with something. Um, and that's very atypical, um, but it has happened. Uh, Matt, you want to add anything to that? Uh, Roxbury's out of Montpelier Police Department's jurisdiction. So, so they don't have any support if something happens there? Uh, yeah, so what my uh, police, well, I'll actually should let the police department ask that question. Go ahead, Matt, sorry. you. They please. So, so I'll speak to that. Certainly I was involved in, in planning with Roxbury and any kind of consult that I could be part of. Um, I would work with them on that, but just the logistics of being that far away, their emergency response is going to be state police and Northfield. Um, just, just for geographics. So, um, but yeah, the, uh, the only um, brick and mortar office I had was at the high school. So everything else was, um, pop-in visits and interacting with, with students when we could or when we were invited by teachers or um, when something was needed. 
Thanks to all three of you. I appreciate all those responses. Uh, any other questions from the board? Brian? I get a question then, Libby. I'm, we did hear a couple anecdotes of some of our students in tonight's discussion, which was great to hear. But I'm curious, do we have any data? Are there any graduate surveys? Are there any, any ways that we would have any data to be able to get a sense for how our students are reacting to the presence of the SRO in the building? The real task is, last year when we worked with RJA, the Racial Justice Alliance, as a policy committee working on the, the DEI, the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. The SRO didn't come up in our discussions. It's not really in that policy. Um, it might've just been overlooked by the students or the policy committee, but I don't remember the conversations we had with our students really raising the SRO as being a big problem in our buildings. So I'm just trying to understand what avenues we might have or data sources to help us inform what our students are feeling inside our building, or buildings, excuse me. We can certainly, we don't have that, that we don't have any data to show you right now, right? Um, around from students specifically, from student voice, we could show you um, up to date and data around suspensions or, you know, and that, and that kind of thing. Um, but we don't have like student voice uh, qualitative data, but we can certainly try to get it. It's hard to get that kind of information now, but we can, we can do our best. Thank you. And Brian, right. that didn't come up during the policy conversation with the students. You're right. If if we are thinking about doing some sort of listening or data collection, I do want to raise that the people who are disproportionately impacted are the people who will be least numerically represented. So it is really important for me to say over and over again, Students with disabilities, LGBTQ students, black and brown students are disproportionately impacted. They are differently impacted in terms of trauma experiences and their voices will be drowned out by, um, you know, like by experiences that aren't the same as theirs. So I think if we, if we go into looking for data, I think it's important to note that this evening we've heard from parent after parent after parent who raises youth of color in our schools that they do feel threatened and they do feel unsafe and that i i think i i think that that has bearing uh to, to me to just listen to with weight that that the people who are disproportionately impacted are saying loud and clear that they are disproportionately impacted and if we go into some sort of data digging i wouldn't want i would want us to think about how we would wait the experiences of people who are yet again likely to be disproportionately impacted. Right, no, you're absolutely right, Mara. I didn't mean to dismiss anybody's experiences, but it was when I personally had a chance to sit down with some of our students and we had these conversations, the SRO just didn't come up. So I was just exploring what might be available to us. Jim, I have a question. Yep, go, go ahead, Jerry. Um, I'm just wondering if we have any information on uh, if we have any risk assessments or anything like that in terms of, um, because I know a lot of times what you prevent doesn't always get good press. So um, in terms of having the officer there in the first place, what is the risk and have we done any work on um, you know, the risk? should fit the position. So if it's less risk, then there would be, it would be less risk for us to move that to some other uh, skill set. So maybe a social worker could do that, but is there a risk there that we are not privy to at the moment? That would be my question is, do we have any information on that? So Jerry, when you're asking about risks, are you are you asking about um, the number of threat assessments, uh, the number of caseload, like kids uh, who yeah. are directly impacted? That yeah, like what what would happen? Um, so right now, some of that is maybe de-escalated in in quiet ways by relationships and trust and that kind of thing, or the officer going to the students home but 
what I guess what is what are we preventing by having the officer? Do we have any information on that? Just what what kind of situations could it become? Because we don't want the unintended consequence of increasing risk, and that could be anything. That could be um, more truancy. That could be kids because of that getting into more trouble and so on and so forth, and all the way to the worst possible scenario. So I just want to understand the risk better. Yeah, I've, it might be hard to, certainly hard to quantify, um, although we could bring some numbers. It would be more qual qualitative information and based on assumptions and, and, and national data that may not match our local data, you know, I, I, I have to think about, we have to think about as a, you have to think about as a board, like getting more specifics that you want me to dig into. And I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, I would just need some, some direction so that I'm telling the story that you need to hear to, to answer that question. Cause I think it's a good one. I think it's a really good one, Jerry. It's just, I, I have to really think about with you all how to get that information. Yeah, no, I'm I'm kind of thinking, and I know that we're at, at eight o'clock and probably should move on. I'm I'm kind of thinking next step. I think we need to kind of revisit this conversation, but it would be great to get, I think, a better sense of of the need in a little more of, of kind of a a written narrative form. Um, any any data we have around the position. Um, I think some sort of, of job description, you know, so we can really, you know, see what the formalized relationship is. And if there isn't a formalized relationship, uh, what one would look like, or at least what the informal one looks like and, and how it, it might be formalized. Um, you know, and then really try to, to build in a way to make sure that um, we're giving the weight that's due to, you know, the stories we've heard tonight, because I, I totally agree with Mara that, um, that you know the the people who are are most disproportionately impacted in a negative way um perhaps by this role uh even if the overall feeling is, is a positive one um are the, the harder ones to to have heard um and making sure that we're hearing them and, and accounting for them and uh you know whatever whatever decision we make going forward or however the role is shaped does that make sense to folks? I think, my, I, Jim, I think you and I would really want to talk about what it is exactly. Yeah. We, we could just problem solve that together. Yeah, no, definitely. But I, I think there's, I think there's a, a hunger for a little more, um, a little more information about what kind of the real definition of this position is, what the relationship is with with other uh, you know, resources, I mean, um, you know, we do have social workers and we do have counselors and they are, I think, an important part of this equation. Um, you know, knowing how all these pieces interact, I think would be very helpful because uh, I think there's some misperceptions around that. Um, uh, so yeah, I think just getting, getting, getting a better sense um, would be useful. Jill? Thank you. I just really quickly, um, I'm humbled as always to be on this board and participate in conversations like this. I certainly um, don't have some sort of prepared statement, but I want to say how um, I think one of the things I'm taking away from this evening is there's actually a lot more to unpack here and a, and a, a knee-jerk decision one way or the other is not really going to get at the problems. We can make decisions and then the problems will remain. I'm actually really, I wanted to point out, you know, the school resource officer certainly isn't the person in charge of um, discipline and, and expulsions and things like that. So that's, just, that's something we should talk about as far as what that data tells us about decisions at the administrative level. And also, um, I've always thought it's funny that in Montpelier, we never talk about the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. When I worked at the agency of ed, we spent a lot of time unpacking that. There's some pretty serious data in there that as a community, we should spend some time reviewing. So, um, so ways of getting that. That was a that was a board agenda item this this year. All we have is the state data. We still don't have the specific okay. data. That's I guess 
compared it with. Yeah. My, my point was just that I'm I'm so impressed and and humbled by the voices that are here tonight. And I think it's pretty obvious that we all want the same things and we all can start to see the needs. And I certainly don't pretend to know all the needs, um, but that the harder work is really getting at the root of the problems. And then what, what are we going to need to try to address them? Um, and, and I think that's going to take a lot of work and I'm, I'm here for it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jill. Uh, well, Libby and I will uh, kind of discuss uh, what this next conversation looks like and try to get, I think, more data on the bigger picture uh, that the SRO fits into. Um, and uh, yeah, and we, we certainly uh, want more community feedback as, as we do that. So we'll, we'll think of a way to get both more community feedback and, and more student feedback too, which I think would be helpful. Um, and staff feedback. And staff feedback. Now, I think that's important as well. Uh, and, and also, I think good point, Jill, bringing in and and uh, Jerry bringing in uh, some of the risks that we're we're looking to address. Um, uh, okay. Uh, well, I do want to thank everyone for uh, just uh, a wonderful conversation. I know these are hard issues. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, members of the public taking the time to to share their stories uh, and to share their perspectives, uh, some of which can be hard to do uh, in a public space, um, hard to do in a private space often. Uh, so we really appreciate the involvement um, and we will we will continue this discussion. It's definitely um, something we want to want to get right um, and take the time to, to do that. Um, so thanks again, and uh, the next item on our kind of slightly uh, rearranged uh, board agenda is board training needs uh, for 2021. Um, the two main ones for contacts that we have done in the past uh, have been around uh, communications and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion issues, uh, and, and the board's uh, role in, in both of those. Um, I think those are continuing topics that we can always, uh, especially the diversity issues that we can always uh, use more information on and delve deeper into. Uh, and with a bunch of new board members, uh, communications is very tricky and, uh, you know, is things like complying with the open meeting laws and use of social media, et cetera. Um, I think it's it's great to, to have those. And I know we've, we've talked about them somewhat. So uh, those are the two that come to mind, um, but I'd love to just open it up and, and we can get some ideas and then Libby and I can uh, start to, when we put together the, the board agenda is looking out, uh, carve out some time for for those to meet those needs. So I just opened it up for, for ideas on, on trainings. Jim, uh, I, I second, um, I definitely second the need. I think we, we all recognize the need after our last training for more trainings on issues surrounding equity, diversity, inclusion. Since I've been on the board, we've had at least two of those. Um, and there's, that's, that's a subject that's right for our attention, especially with our equity policy. But um, in communication, I think there's always value to that, especially figuring out how to bring community members deeper into the conversation and how to ensure that in this 21st century, we're not violating an open meeting law, which is really well intended, um, but it hasn't fully caught up with the times, I, I feel. But um, so that's always an, a tricky needle to thread. But another issue, in addition to those that I, I think would be helpful, is we're going to be looking at some really, uh, I have a feeling, difficult financial decisions over the next year or two. And I think it would be helpful for the board to better understand where the money comes from, how ed funding works. I mean, we get this in the budget once a year. And I know some of us, Jill, myself, or, and, and you having been on the board for a while, are, are better versed and everybody has a little bit of an idea who's on the board, but I, I think that's something that can help everybody and, and especially help facilitate conversations so that we all understand um, 
what's going on in this really uh, difficult financial climate that we're looking at over the next year or two. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. And I, th um, yeah, and I think that'll not only educate us all, but uh, as we enter what might be uh, some, you know, difficult state level policy decisions, uh, knowing how to intelligently engage those, uh, knowing what's at stake, uh, I think that in training like that would all help us help us with that. Um, any other any other suggestions? Brian? Jim, I'm not sure I would propose it as a full training, um, but it did come up in one of our last policy committee meetings that I don't believe the board has had a discussion about policy governance or governance by policy um, since we've had several new board members come on and thinking about our conversation with the community this evening and hearing everybody in action and no action. And I think it'll be worthwhile to have a broad discussion about how we govern as a board and how we make decisions and how we take community impact and make that happen in the district. Um, so I think that would probably be something on our radar, at least for a general overview, if not a full training. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good suggestion as well. Um, others? I think, I think those four give us a pretty, pretty good slate. Um, Okay, well, thank you for those. Uh, we will, um, and I will we'll look into that. Um, next is gonna be a, a real uh, crowd pleaser. Um, review of committee assignments, negotiations, and let me first start this off by thanking um, Ryan, Bridget, Andrew uh, for uh, really working tirelessly over the last several months. Um, and uh, really, yeah, I think for all three of you over the last you know, couple of years and Bridget, I think even longer than that, uh, to, to get us to a great place with negotiations this year and in years past, I know that is a ton of work. I know it is, is often feels pretty thankless. So um, I, I really wanna thank you for stepping out and, and doing, doing the tough work on that. That's super important to the district. Uh, it's, but it's, it's hard and it's intensive and it can be draining on many levels. So, um, we really appreciate all you've done over, over the last several years and, and over the spring to, um, to, to, to do that work. Uh, um, so thank you for that. That said, I think it's, it's time and I know we've got a, a couple of members who aren't able to make it tonight, um, to, to give, the folks who want to break a break. Um, and uh, we don't have to make a decision tonight, but if anybody wants to step forward to be part of the negotiations team, uh, we are certainly looking for new volunteers. Uh, and if you want to wait until we can talk to, to Emma and, and Anniket, um, uh, we can do that as well. But I, I, I think if anyone steps forward, they probably will not be stepping on toes. Uh, well Jim, I will, I will say something that we've talked with Pietro about a little bit is that we have pretty much the smallest negotiating team he's Ever. seen. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm willing to do it, but I do think it would be helpful to have at least, I don't know how Ryan's feeling. He might be pretty stretched right now. I'd be willing to do it again, but I really would like another person or two um, and if Ryan were going to step down, then it would be two. But if Ryan were still going to do it, I think it would be helpful to have a third person because you can share the load a little better that way. Andrew, you'd be willing. We could twist your arm to do it again. You love negotiations. I do so, love yeah. negotiations. <laughs> it's very time consuming. I don't love that part. No, but you, you're good in, the, in that meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, do you, do you mean that you think it's helpful to have three people for each contract, like three people in the room? I think for the, or, for the, for the NEA one, I can't speak to the other contracts, but for the NEA one, um, you know, it's Ryan and me, if there were a third person, it's not having them in the room so much, but every once in a while, somebody can't make a meeting, it would give us a little more flexibility. It would also, if, for example, we were looking to draft some language or look in 
to, you know, a financial trend that we wanted to bring to the table and discuss, it would, um, it would, it would just allow us to do that. I also think it can be helpful. You know, we come to the board and say, we're representing the board when, when we're negotiating. Right. And I think it can be helpful to have a little bit more of the board there so that we feel a little bit more like, you know, this is the voice of the board and not just the voice of Andrew and Ryan. Yeah. I, that all makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think having three people for the, for the teachers union makes sense. I'm not sure that every contract needs three people. Um, yeah. Just for the teachers. But, that's the one I was thinking. And I'm not volunteering for the other ones. <laughs> right. Right. But I, I just wanted to make the point that if we need three people at the teachers and we have two other units, we really need more like four or five people. Because we do have one year contracts for all three units. So next fall we'll be starting all three up again. Yep. I mean, I, I may be willing to do the teachers, but, um, I would, would love to, to see what others, others interests are. And then we don't, we can definitely think about it. And, um, Jill? Yeah, can, can we wait until we have the full board here? Absolutely. I just, I just wanted to, and I noticed, I mean, I, I think we can definitely wait until we have the full board, but if anyone is like, yeah, I, I want to do it. I yeah. sort of want to do it, but I'm, I'm worried uh -huh. about my time constraints. <laughs> I think it would be fun though. <laughs> um, so if anybody wants to wait, I don't know if you come on, uh, but you know, feel free to step forward if if you uh, if I think you Jill see. is stepping forward. Yeah. No, actually, <laughs> I um I was just saying I think the way that um Emma was appointed after it was after town meeting. I that I feel like we at one point sort of skipped over the formal assignment of her to a committee. Um, so I was just going to echo what Jerry's saying that I, I, I would be happy to do whatever I would be most useful at. I would definitely need some training. Um, I, I, I have a pretty extensive knowledge about, you know, educator contracts, but I also don't want to just keep saying, oh, I'll serve on that if it's not going to be valuable. And I want to make sure that Emma and Annika have a chance to, to formally be, um, you know, I think Annika has, but I, I don't think Emma's been formally assigned to a committee and there's a lot of good work to be done. So I'm happy to go wherever I'm needed, but I think maybe like to Jerry's point, maybe when we get everybody back in. Yeah, that's a good point about Emma. Emma and I have talked about committee assignments, but we have not formalized it yet. Um, and I do want to say, Jill, that you are probably starting out well ahead of, of about 99% of board members who, who sit in their first negotiation. So uh, if you're willing to do it, that would be fantastic, but we'll, we'll give you a little time and, and uh, I'll, I'll reach out to Anna and Emma and uh, we'll, we'll maybe push this a little harder next meeting. Um, all right, anything else on, uh, on that? Uh, again, think about it and we'll, uh, we'll circle back to it. Um, next meeting and and try to get Anakit and that was great. I think both I think you know all folks would be would be great. But uh Jill we may we may pencil you in. Um, um especially because the Main Street Middle School Building Committee is in indefinitely on hold, especially since we don't know what in person learning will look like a year or two, three from now. So Okay, so we will uh, pencil in Andrew and Jill. Um, we will very lightly pencil in me, um, and we'll talk to Emma and Annika, and if anyone else. And Jerry, uh, it sounds like and you Jerry. might do. Yeah, so um, let's let's put those in pen in the next week or two after we talk to Emma and Annika. Um, uh, community values vision proposal for Sue and, from uh, Sue McCormick and Keisha Ram. Uh, uh, Libby? I put their proposal in the board packet, so you should have that. Um, so I think it, it's just a matter of the board discussing if you want to move ahead with that direction or not, and to what extent, because I think she put in a, I, I have to admit that I haven't read it since she actually sent it to me, which was about two weeks ago, um, but I believe she had a couple options in there. But I think, I think you all just, you need to um, decide if you want to move forward with those two. Yeah, there was a four month and uh, yeah. maybe 
six months or 12 months. I can't remember now. I, I have to com confess, I started reading it and then something came up and I put it down and I never read it. Ooh, shame, shame on you, Andrew. I, I uh, didn't get it. I guess I didn't get a really good idea of what would be included. I didn't get a, big, a really good idea of what we would be responsible for versus what what is included in the price. So I guess my feedback is I would want um, more information on roles and responsibilities, specifically what they would be doing because some of it was unclear. I can write that up, Libby, and send you an email if that helps. Yeah, that'd be, that would be great, Terry. I was just writing a note to myself, but that would be. Okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we were kind of right. poised to have a really good, strong conversation. There's so much sort of momentum about the conversation yeah. and the pieces that they want to talk about. And we have, you know, we have new leadership coming in. I, but I also want to be uh, realistic about the challenges that COVID has presented. And I just don't know where that fits in here because it's not like we have money laying around. But mm -hmm. it does seem like if there's some way we can ride that this would be a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, I have to admit, I didn't um, totally understand the difference between the two uh contracts was, were they actually two things or like two phases of the same task i think it was one that was um kind of the upfront just community values kind of conversation to be able to formulate that and and draw in and i'm i'm making assumptions here so i'm not speaking for susan or Keisha, so please don't think i am um but what i've seen them work through in the past or at least who work through in the past is bringing community together and facilitating really hard conversations um, around what, and so we truly can name those values. That would be probably the first piece. And then the second piece is taking that deeper into um, where, we're, where we're going as a district in terms of our school buildings. That, I, I believe that's my understanding of it. And were there, there, I mean, there's an estimated fee for phase one, an estimated fee for phase two. Are those um, two separate fees? I think the phase two would be the add-on to the phase one. Yeah. Yeah. I had that same question. I was not clear about the the price. Yeah. So okay. phase one is just under fifteen thousand, and phase two looks like it's anywhere between twelve and thirty. Um, so that would be in addition to the fifteen. I, I think I so. Think yeah, so. Much longer. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and and to be clear, it's more expensive because we we've. we've we got a price from two very capable um, people. Uh, so these are these are two facilitators that are well known and respected throughout the state with this work and with lots of different types of work. So um, they're I recognize that they are not cheap, but I also recognize I've worked with Sue before, and I'm making an assumption about Keisha from reputation that they're pretty good at what they do. Susan is very good at what she does. So that's, uh, that's why the price tag is a little bit more than I, I had a little sticker shock on that too. Yeah. Um, what are thoughts or do we need a little extra time to, to think about it? Um, it seems like something. Jim, I, I still, um, because if you read the bullets and it's been a week since I read it, but it just wasn't clear to me what the board members would be responsible for versus what was included in the price. So my only concern was um, if you read it one way and we're responsible for doing X, Y, and Z, I'm a little bit worried about capacity and our, our ability to take that on. Um, and if you read it another way and they're doing it, well, great. You know that, and what, what, what do we need to do to support that? So I guess I just would like to better understand the work since it is at Roxbury and Ryan and I will be, I assume, um, pretty involved in that. So I just want to understand what what will be expected. So Jim, could I make the suggestion that 
read it for read it through in the next week or so or next couple of days and send board members can send me questions that I'll send yeah. to Susan and Keisha and uh, Keisha to get um, more clarity. Would that be a good move step forward? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, because it is relatively general. I, th I think Jerry makes good points. I mean, I think we kind of understand from the meeting what we wanted, but I'm not sure it's totally reflected in this document. Yep. Yep. So send me questions um, or points of clarity that you're looking for. Okay. Thanks, Sebi. I'll be happy to share that with them. Uh, um, excellent. I, all right. Uh, so at 825, we are going to roll on into the uh, safety guidelines for fall 2020 overview. Um, crystal clear, Libby? <laughs> yeah, we got our plan all worked out. <laughs> um, so I sent all of you the link for that. I'm assuming you all have had a chance to digest that, hopefully with a good um, stiff drink in your hand as well. Uh, it's it's going to be a pretty hard sloth for the next four weeks or so, four, four to six weeks. Um, I'm not going to go through all of, all of the guidelines because you all have it. Um, and if you haven't read it, then please do so. Uh, our, I can tell you that our administrators all took a vacation um, last week. One is still on vacation. Um, he took one, a later one, so he's taking it this week. Um, but we've come. We all came back today and had a four hour meeting today just to really dissect it. Um, and in terms of what are the rules, what are the one things that were clearly laid out for us that we have to follow? And even those are a little um, wishy-washy uh, in other areas. Um, and what are, the, what are the real places that we need clarification from, from the AOE? Um, and that list is pretty long as well. Or where are the places that we have to have some really good conversation? Uh, what was abundantly clear is none of this is going to be easy, um, and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we did start with creating um, a purpose statement that will go on all of our communications around this, um, and that is, I'm just reading it from our agenda this morning, in planning for the 2021 school year, all decisions will include our collective physical and social emotional needs as we continue to foster a rigorous, equitable, accessible, and flexible academic environment given these dynamic circumstances. So just that statement alone says where our heads are, and it also says the difficulty that we're going to face. Um, so the first order of business I had actually, my first meeting on um, Tuesday of this week was with Stacey Emerson and transportation uh, because those decisions need some decisions need to be made sooner rather than later. And so um, next week, most likely, our families will be getting a survey just to say these are the guidelines we're going to have to follow on the bus. Uh, are you still in need? Are you going to be needing transportation for your students? Um, with quite honestly, the hope of of weeding some of some of the need out um, so we can get a better clarity of, of how many kids, just how many kids are we transporting? Because I think that's going to be different than in years past. Um, and once we have those numbers, making our bus routes around that and um, and then get having families commit to actually using our transportation. Uh, so in the past, it's been if you use it if you want to, it's available. But I believe this year we're going to have to because of contact tracing of capabilities, we're gonna to have to have families commit to transportation. That's not saying that if a family isn't is in, is in, needs help and needs to get their kid on a bus, you know, a couple of days to get the kid to school, that's absolutely, we can do that. Um, but we need some more solid numbers um, because of the responsibility around contact tracing. So that's coming out next week to families. Um, I believe we agreed on a weekly district communication um, to families as decision points are made so that we're in constant communication. Uh, across the summer, I know some families are, are um, antsy for decisions and bottom line is these decisions are gonna take time and we need time to, to figure them out with our administration and our, and our union and our uh, nurses and all the people who are involved in this conversation. It's not gonna be easy. That was made crystal clear to us this morning <laughs> as we dug in together. 
So, so I mean, that's kind of my up update. I can go through that guidance and the main points for you, but I think you've all read them. And, um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability or write the questions down and answer them when I can. Yeah, no, I think, I think at this time, um, even though it's 8.30, uh, we, we haven't read them already, can. Uh, any, any questions, though, for Libby? Um, Jill? And just really quick, I think I've asked this before, too, is I'm wondering if we have any flexibility with, with staff to meet the needs. I'm thinking of the nurse at Roxbury, if temperature taking is still a part of it. Um, or, or with the school length of time, if there's, if that is still in our contract, very prescriptive for the time of day where people are coming and going, or if there is in light of this, any flexibility with where staff are going or timing. Mm -hmm. So there's two questions there. There's one about, uh, Roxbury and nursing. Uh, that may be a question that we will bring to the board to say we need we, we need to talk about this. We have not been able to hire a point two nurse, a new point two nurse FTE at Roxbury yet. Um, so I say we're not trying still, but we are. Uh, but we may need to increase that capacity um, or figure out a different way to do it through contracted services. I'm not even sure. You know, I've, I've kind of put my nurse, my the Montpelier nurses on that challenge um, because they know the world better than I do. Um, they, I know there's been waivers asked for, and I don't know if we've gotten them yet from the state level to the feds, because I believe there's a school nursing license. And um, so I believe the state has asked for waivers around that so that just nurses could play this role. Um, and I'm not sure if they've had that, that guidance. Um, and actually the, the temperature checking and health check, um, Roxbury is actually the easiest place for this to happen, um, even though we don't have a nurse, because each of their classrooms have an individual door. And so keeping kids socially distanced and entering the building in a, in a we don't, we actually probably won't need to stagger starts or anything at Roxbury um, because of the size of the building and just the way the building's set up, which is lovely. Um, and the other question I heard you ask about was school day. Currently in the contract, the school day is from 7.30 to three. And we have not talked with the union about any flexibility around that. Um, we just, we're not there yet in the conversation. So um, we believe the school day will happen within those hours, whether students will be there for the full um, 8.30 to 3 as they should, or 8 to 8.30 to 3 as they usually are, is a different question. Um, however, we, be we believe we are going to try to work within those hours. And see, that's our starting point, <laughs> but that could change in three weeks. Uh, we have not had that conversation with the union yet because we're not there. Okay, I guess, and thank you, that, that helps. Um, I had just had a parent asking about the late start set up for professional development and a lot of like the, you know, three and four day weekends um, that was sort of surprised that those were still in there, at least at the middle school. Um, Wait, and uh, kind of catch up. The state has alluded to, so when I say the state, Dan French has alluded to potentially changing school calendars um, from the state level in some way. We haven't gotten any more information on that other than him alluding to the possibility. So, um, so yeah, so I'm kind of waiting on really looking at our calendar and because I don't want to make decisions about the calendar and then have to go back on them because the state does something, tells us to do something differently. Um, and we don't have our Thursday meeting with Dan this week. It will start again next week. So that's a question I'm sure people will be asking. Um, to get more clarity on because he's alluded to it in past meetings. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? I have a question going back to the SRO piece. Do we, do you want to bring that back next board meeting or, um, or at a different date? I just want to know where it needs to fall in terms of gathering lots of data. Um, I think since it's summer and, uh, I, I think we can push it off for another couple of board meetings to give you guys the time to. It will be it. hard to get information from staff and students over the summer. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I think getting that information's needed. So, um, so Jim, let's talk about it when we talk about board agenda yeah. to, um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I don't think we're going to know much more in two weeks than we know now. Or in, in, in two weeks, could we have, so that we just keep things going and we don't peter out here um, and lose community confidence in any kind of process here, can we um, establish at our next board meeting a general timeline for all of this? Sure. Yes, yeah, so that, that would be more of a board discussion. Yes, Andrew, is that what you're imagining? Yeah, and I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on it, but and I realize you're dealing with an unprecedented situation as an administration, um, and you're dealing with two unpre you're dealing with two crises essentially at the same time. Um, and so I want to make sure that that we give each of those situations the attention and focus um, that they deserve. I don't, I'm, I'm concerned that if we say, oh, we'll come back to this in several meetings from now, it's just going to kind of fall off and then we'll get to it later on. Um, and so obviously dealing with COVID-19 is front and center for your preparations, but in terms of getting us information to make a decision, about an SRO and the role of an SRO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think I think we need to, at the very least, have a timeline established for um, what we're going to be doing, what information we're going to be collecting, that type of that type of thing. I don't think we should push that off for over a month or two. That's my general thought. So, so Jim and I are clear. It's it's uh, the board having the discussion of create, creating that timeline, or would you like us to come with a timeline? established and jim maybe we can talk about that but i just want to make sure that we're clear around why don't we why don't we propose a timeline um you know kind of uh i think we do want to inspire confidence that we are pushing this process forward because that's what we want to do but um i also think of you know meetings where we don't have all the information we need um that's not helpful either. So why don't we put together a timeline that's that's realistic, that's based on when you feel you can, you know, get the information you need from the city, from the police department, from students, from staff, um, et cetera. And then we'll propose that and, and, and put that out there and, and have some clear markers on, on how the process is going to look and why the timeline makes sense. Okay. Okay, uh, we have one more agenda item, which is policy reading, first reading of the uh, C-28 transgender and gender non-conforming students. Um, uh, do we have any, um, I don't know what the process is for reading. We just have discussion and, and it's a reading, right? Is there any other magical thing that needs to happen? No jail point to suggestions and revisions and things. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're asking if someone has to literally read it out loud, I, I don't think that has to happen no. in the packet. <laughs> that I know, but is there something between reading out loud and um, so uh, uh, any uh, comments, suggestions, revisions, uh, edits? Uh, I thought it was was well done, and and thank you, uh, Ryan and policy team for uh, for putting it together. Um, I know there were a couple of questions about we reference a 2016 uh, federal policy that that is no longer in effect, and I think it might be worth noting that it's no longer in effect, even though uh, the the guidance there is instructive, and I think the direction we want to go. Um, that's kind of the only comment I have. Jim, I could follow up with that and say that I would propose when this comes back for another reading that we actually remove the footnotes entirely after, okay. we've, not, after we've had a chance to see where their references came from. Um, it would be easier to maintain this as a living document without the, reference, the footnotes, excuse me. All right, that is, I'm a big fan of no footnotes, so um, despite being a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that 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 is good with me. Um, any objections to that? 
No, that makes sense to me. I, I agree with Ryan that if you if you footnote everything, then you have to keep paying attention to what changes, and it's better to just keep the policy the policy. Um, other other edits, uh, typos, um, general comments. Mara? Libby, I had a quick question. Um, we mentioned, and I think I think Ryan wrote about this in an email to you. We mentioned school activities, and I didn't know if sports are included under school activities or if we address sports in a different place. Sports, yeah, I can look at this further, Mara. I, I could be talking out of turn because it's not my area of expertise. Um, so I'm just going to premise this with that, but. From my understanding, the rules about sports are a VPA matter, um, and VPA makes the rules on that piece. And I believe they've already ruled in um, in favor of the LGBTQ plus. Um, yeah, I, mean, I help them write their policy. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think you have to go by VPA rules there, and I don't believe that you need it in your policy. I think the question Jill Ryan and I had was, is there somewhere in our policy manual that would direct people to go to VPA if they were looking for, I just know that if I'm looking for sports policy, I'm like policies, they're probably- well, I, mean, I think it's a principal's association. <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> The first time that I heard Vermont Principals Association did sports, I was like, what? That's not all I do. There's a name for that. Like, yeah. But it's not intuitive. And I just didn't know if we had anywhere within our policy book that would direct people looking at sports questions to VPA for their policy pieces. We do not have, well, we don't have a policy book. We have a binder and animals a binder um, we, on our policy page on the board policy page it doesn't mention sports in any way shape or form um i think those questions would probably go to matt link first our athletic director and matt would either answer them or, or send people to to the vpa so i think people in our district can certainly point people that way but if you're looking for it independently you're probably going to struggle to find it unless you google high school sports vermont you probably hit the vpa page so we might be able to put something on our policy webpage that indicates like where to find. Like as simple as for any questions regarding sports policy, VPA. Yeah, send them to the, I would assume that they're linked on their website. I haven't actually looked, but I would assume they're linked on their website. So we certainly could put that link on our policies page. Anna can probably do that in about 15 seconds. <laughs> She's got her thumb up. She's ready to go. Um, do we need anything else for the reading? Or can we consider it read? Bring it back for the second reading next meeting. Yep. Okay, without Thank you, Mara. Thank you, guys. Um, I think next item is motion to adjourn. Um, I move we adjourn. Do I have a second? A second. Uh, Jill. Here. <laughs> okay. Aye. Aye. Here, but not for long. Mara. Aye. Uh, Ryan. Aye. Good night. Good night, uh, Jerry. Aye. I think that's it. it, it at least it's enough. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Bye everyone. Oh, I actually had a really quick question about records. Am I allowed to ask a question? If we just adjourned. What do we what do we do about the chat? Like, is Anna supposed to take a copy of that? Like, you can export it. I just didn't know if those things have to be counted as public record. Anna, do you know the answer? I don't know if there is an answer. I don't. I've been thinking about it. Um, we could just we could just export it to be yeah, safe. Yeah, we're gonna preserve it. We can. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions that I think I want. We want to ask the VSBA, Jim. I was asking Jim because it kind of made public comment continue. 
yeah. out, outside of the public comment space. Um, and I don't know if that's right, if that's wrong, if that's okay, if it's not okay. So I think that might be a question for the VSBA. Yeah, I was actually thinking the same thing. I, I, maybe for tonight, Anna, if you can just export it so we've got it yeah. somewhere in the world. And then it's like, it, Zoom is notoriously hard to save the chat on. It's like really dumb. This is so, kind of readable. Yeah. Um, so there is an export function like in the settings. And yeah, stuff. you got that. Yeah. Yeah. I like a main host, but you'll need to do that. I don't. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question though because um, yeah, it, it's somewhere between continuous public comment um, and chatter. Sometimes we'll get on email during a, a meeting. From I think the difference is that everyone in the meeting can see the comments and respond to them, so it becomes it like becomes, a dialogue that's happening. Yeah, it becomes a, a dialogue, which. Goes into public comment. Yeah, yeah. I, it's okay. I think it's a question for the VSBA. Yeah, great. We'll uh, we'll get on that. Yeah, we'll follow that up. Thanks. Uh, All right. Uh, you you just go to the bottom right and hit save chat. I think. Yeah, I did it. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks all. All right. Take care. Uh, And I got it up for it. I'll send it to you. Great, thank you. And let's uh, let's remember to ask the VSBA tomorrow about the chat. Because I think we can shut it off if we want, if we need to. But I don't know what the rules are. All right. Yeah, we're responsive to in the morning. Thank you. All right. See ya.